Thank you for joining us for today's AVACTA webinar, Atopic Dermatitis in the Light of New Treatments, Tailoring the Solution to Fit the Problem. I'm delighted to welcome to Webinar Club our speaker for today, Professor Richard Halliwell and Kirsten Pattenberg. Thank you, Professor Halliwell. I am now going to hand over to you. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on canine atopic dermatitis in the light of new treatments. So firstly, we're just going to run over an outline of the webinar. We're going to start with definitions. Secondly, an update on the pathogenesis. Third, making the diagnosis. And then fourth, Kirsten is going to deal with the therapeutic options available. And then I'm going to come back and go over 10 uh, neat little cases of atopic dermatitis, each a little different, to focus on the treatment selection. And finally, what to do about non-responders. So briefly then, um, canine atopic dermatitis is a genetically predisposed inflammatory and pruritic allergic skin disease with characteristic clinical features. It is associated most commonly with IgE antibodies to environmental allergens. There's a subset which probably comprise about 5% of cases which are called canine atopic-like dermatitis defined as an inflammatory and pruritic skin disease with clinical features identical to those seen in canine atopic dermatitis in which an IgE response to environmental or other allergens cannot be documented. These present a challenge because we can't define any allergens responsible for the disease and so we can't for these cases use allergen specific immunotherapy. <clears throat> So what's the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis? We've been fortunate in the last uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years in that we've developed some inbred strains of dogs which spontaneously develop atopic dermatitis. And studies on these have shown that there is an impaired skin barrier function which permits more ready access of allergen. And the allergen does gain access, in distinction to what we used to think 20 or 30 years ago, via the skin. Secondly, there's an impaired T helper 1, T helper 2 balance, which favors the development of IgE antibody. Thirdly, the disease appears to be IgE mediated in the acute phase and cell mediated in the chronic phase. Thus, as well as circulating IgE, there are dermal infiltrates with T cells that contribute to the inflammation. <clears throat> In the last 10 years or so, a key role for interleukin-31 has been defined. It was shown that levels are higher in human beings with atopic dermatitis. They are even higher in severe atopic dermatitis. They are higher in dogs with atopic dermatitis than they are in normals. And finally, that injection of interleukin-31 into normal beagles induces pruritus and lesions similar to spontaneous atopic dermatitis. So this is a chart which shows uh, the workings of IL-31. It's a member of the IL-6 cytokine family. It's produced by a variety of immune cells, such as activated T cells, macrophages, mast cells, dendritic cells. And it binds here to the receptor on the cell, the heterodymic receptor, and gains access to the cell where it triggers a number of immunological events. So IL-31 is present in the circulation, as you see here, and it also then gains access to the cell via the receptor. So cytopoint, or Lokivetmab, works via mopping up or the IL-31 in the circulation, whereas um, Apoquel uh, oclocitinib works by preventing access of the IL-31 to the receptor. In this chart, we look at the sites of action of various 
um, therapeutic modalities. So at the top, we've got genetics uh, predisposing to the allergic disease, adjuvant events such as parasitic infection, which can predispose to IgE antibody. Properties of allergen, some antigens are more allergenic than others. The Th2 polarization, and then we get Th2 cells in the skin, skin homing T lymphocytes, IL-31, which then acts on the dorsal root ganglia, keratinocytes, mast cells, and macrophages to produce pruritus and inflammation. If we go back to the beginning of this cascade, we can see that immunotherapy and cyclosporin are effective at the root cause of the disease. So they will normalize the Th2 polarization. So they are the only two therapeutic modalities that have the potential to actually cure the disease by normalizing the Th2 polarization. They don't, of course, do this in all cases. Would that they will. If we look at locivetmab or cytopoint, this mops up the IL-31 in the circulation. If we look at ocacitinib or apoquel, this prevents access of the IL-31 to the cells. If we look at systemic corticosteroids, these act at a number of points in this cascade, which explains why they're very effective. But of course, we don't want to use them in the long term. And if we look at hydrocortisone or sepinate, such as cortivance, um, this drug acts on the Th2 cells and the skin homing T lymphocytes in the skin. So if we want to cure the disease to get at the root cause, we want a drug to act on this part. Um, whereas if we want immediate relief of the disease, then we want a drug that acts on this part of the cascade. Most dermatologists make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis by observing compatible clinical signs and excluding other causes for those clinical signs, including adverse food reactions. Favreau has defined nine historical and clinical criteria which are typical of atopic dermatitis. Age of onset, less than three years of age. It almost never starts over seven years of age. Mostly indoor, reflecting the fact that our most important allergen is hostess mites, which of course are not generally found in the outdoor environment. Corticosteroid responsive pruritus, chronic or recurrent yeast infections. You see here lichenification, hyperkeratosis, uh, hyperkeratosis um, and pigment development, uh, hyperpigmentation, and smears from this show the very nice peanut-shaped uh, malassezia yeasts. Affected, affected front feet. Affected ear pinny. And in the early stages of atopic dermatitis, we get inflammation of the inner ear flap uh, extending down towards the horizontal canal. But initially, the deep horizontal canal is completely clear of inflammation. In chronic cases, of course, we'll get secondary infection in the horizontal canal. Non-affected ear margins. Scabies, of course, characteristically affects the ear margins. We want to be sure to eliminate scabies, which is still around. Non-affected dorsolumbar region, uh, which, of course, suggests flea allergy. And then in the early stages of this disease, we get pruritus without any lesions, such as you see here. <coughs> Important caveats, finally, regarding allergy tests, intradermal tests, or serology for allergen-specific IgE. The main reasons for undertaking these tests are to enable selection of allergens for allergen-specific uh, allergen immunotherapy. Secondly, to enable distinction between atopic dermatitis and atopic-like dermatitis. Thirdly, in the case of food allergens, serology assists in the selection of the most appropriate hypoallergenic diet trial. Important, very important to emphasize that a positive intradermal test or serology does not of its own make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis 
or an adverse food reaction, as some normal dogs will also show positive tests. So now I'm going to ha hand over to Kirsten, who's going to deal with the therapeutic Yeah, thank you, Professor Hollywell. I will go through the therapeutic approach with you. Now, topic dogs usually require combination therapy, and what we need to consider is the primary disease, skin barrier, secondary complications, flare factors, skin coat hygiene, and allergen avoidance measures. And I will discuss these points in more detail now. For controlling the primary disease, these are the anchor treatments we have available at the moment with the latest edition, the Loki Vat map, and I will go through each treatment option individually now. Allergen-specific immunotherapy should be considered in any dog with atopic dermatitis. It is a very safe treatment option. In order to identify offending allergens, we can either use intraderma or IgE serology testing. There is no evidence that one test is superior than the other, and there's also no standardization of tests, and in fact, the results can vary substantially between laboratories or even specialists performing intradermal testing. But despite these important limitations, an online survey showed that one-third of dog owners who had used this intervention for a couple of years rated it as very or extremely effective. And it is expected that between approximately 50 to 80 percent of dogs treated with immunotherapy will show an improvement in either clinical signs and or decrease in anti-inflammatory antipyretic medication use. There is also evidence that a proportion of atopic dogs develop an IgE-mediated hypersensitivity to malassezia and or staphylococcus, suggesting that these antigens contribute to the inflammation and serve as an allergen. And although the clinical relevance of this is not fully understood yet, it would seem logical to include malassezia and or staphylococcus in the immunotherapy. There is no clear advantage of a particular immunotherapy protocol of other ones. Uh, if this is traditional or rush protocol, it should be decided based on the patient and also the injection frequency and amounts injected should be tailored to each individual patient depending on the clinical improvement or adverse events observed. Because of the delay in onset, anti-inflammatory drugs are usually, or antipyritic drugs are usually needed initially alongside the immunotherapy to maintain good quality of life and control clinical signs. And because of this delay, immunotherapy must be continued for at least one year to properly evaluate its efficacy. Cyclosporin is particularly effective in chronic inflammation. It also has a delay in onset, which is why it's not suitable for treating acute flares. So it should also be continued for at least a month before evaluating the response or making any dosage adjustments. But the speed of clinical improvement can be increased by adding in short courses of either glucocorticoids or oclocitinib or possibly lokivetmab, although this has not been studied. But the concurrent long-term administration of glucocorticoids or oclacitinib with cyclosporin is not recommended due to the potential for immunosuppression. It is not approved for dogs less than six months of age or less than two kilo in body weight. And minor adverse events are quite common, such as vomiting and diarrhea, but most improve spontaneously, and cyclosporin has a proven long-term safety. The starting dose is 5 mg per kilo once daily, and once the clinical signs are controlled, the dose can then either be tapered by increasing dosage interval from every day to every other day, or by decreasing the daily dose by half. And if possible, the dose can be even tapered further. The generic cyclosporin formulations are acceptable substitutes for the first approved cyclosporin because they have shown to be bioequivalent. 
Topical glucocorticoids are very beneficial when treating acute flares, localized lesions, and the hydrocortisone spray from Verbac has shown to be highly effective for reducing skin lesions and pruritus. And although largely untested, other topical glucocorticoid formulations are likely to provide clinical benefit as well. The most common adverse effect with prolonged application on the same area of skin atrophy, and for that reason, glucocorticoids should be applied intermittently after an induction phase. And oral glucocorticoids are needed when their lesions are more generalized. They are very beneficial for inducing remission and treating acute flares. Side effects with glucocorticoids are very common and normally proportional to dosage and duration. And the long-term use can also result in calcinosis cutis and predispose to the development of demodicosis. The inflammation associated with these conditions, calcinosis cutis, demodicosis, can cause owners to incorrectly believe the allergic signs are flaring up and they will then increase the dose or frequency. The initial starting dose is typically half a milligram per kilo, once to twice daily, and then tapered to the lowest effective dose and frequency. Because of the risk for adverse effects, the use of long-acting injectable glucocorticoids is not recommended, uh, recommended unless the patient cannot be treated orally. And in order to reduce the dose needed even further, we can combine glucocorticoids with other medications or supplements that might have a steroid sparing effect. There is not much published yet, but the antihistamine trimeprazine and the essential fatty acid supplement by Acutin Plus have demonstrated steroid sparing effect. Oclocetinib, likewise the glucocorticoids, leads to a fast improvement of clinical science, which makes it also suitable for treating acute flares. It is not approved for dogs less than 12 months of age or less than 3 kilo body weight. Short-term and long-term once-daily treatment appears to be relatively safe, but long-term safety of other dosing regimes is unknown yet. And although serious adverse events appear rare, the long-term administration is associated with some side effects, and it may also predispose to the development of demodicosis. The starting dose is 0.4 to 0.6 milligram per kilo twice daily for the first two weeks, and then once daily. Um, once, um, if we, um, the clinical signs are uh, under control, we should also attempt further tapering. And again, the concurrent long-term administration with glucocorticoids or cyclosporin is not recommended due to the potential for immunosuppression. And the latest addition, the Loki VAT map, um, this is a monoclonal antibody that specifically targets and neutralizes canine interleukin-31, an important cytokine involved in the pathogenesis. It rapidly reduces pruritus and may therefore be beneficial for acute, treating acute flares. It's administered by subcut, uh, subcutaneous injection every four weeks at the dosage of one milligram per kilo. Um, this is the, the dosage um, uh, for the EU license. There is no age restriction, but it is not approved for dogs less than three kilo body weight. It should exhibit little to no interaction with other medications or concurrent diseases because monoclonal antibodies are very specific, very targeted. Long-term safety of this therapy is not known yet, but likely to be good. And I will now move on to the, the next point, repairing the skin barrier. Um, <coughs> Essential fatty acids can, can help repairing and normalizing the skin barrier defects. This can either be achieved with dietary supplementation or feeding an enriched diet or topical formulations. They are not suitable for monotherapy because of the limited degree of improvement and the benefit might not be seen before two months of supplementation. So it is important to continue with this for some time before evaluating the response. 
Whenever an aggravation of signs occur in, in a dog that was previously well controlled, then secondary complications should be considered. And bacterial and yeast infections are very common reasons why lesions and pruritus acutely worsen. And other flare factors include fleas, but we also have to consider food and environmental allergens such as house dust mites and pollen. The diagnosis of bacteri uh, bacterial infection is based on compatible clinical science, supportive cytology, and or culture. Superficial and localized lesions are typically treated with topical therapy, but if the lesions are more widespread or severe, systemic antibiotics are needed. And whenever a case is unresponsive to therapy, bacterial culture and sensitivity testing should be performed. Yeast infections are identified based on compatible clinical science and supportive cytology. And again, superficial le localized lesions can be treated with topical therapy. But if the lesions are widespread or severe, then systemic antifungal drugs are needed. Atopic dogs are predisposed to develop flea bite hypersensitiv uh, hypersensitivity if exposed repeatedly to flea bites. And therefore, atopic dogs should be treated year-round um, with year-round flea control combined with environmental measures. And it is also worth bearing in mind that the efficacy of topical flea products is often limited by frequent bathing. In this case, more frequent applications or switching to oral products should be considered. The most recent flea products, the Fluralana, Sarolana, and Afoxolana, have shown to be effective against some mites. And in fact, the Sarolana has now got a license for the treatment of Demodex, Acoptis, and Autodectin. So prescribing these alongside long-term glucocorticoid or oclacitinib therapy may guard against the development of demodicosis. And our next point is skin and coat hygiene. Simply weekly bathing with a mild non-irritating shampoo can have a direct soothing effect on the skin. It physically removes surface allergens and microbes and also increases skin hydration. The type of shampoo used should be tailored to each patient. And it's also worth bearing in mind that frequent bathing can further dry and irritate the skin. And if that is the case, the product or the protocol should be changed, or topical moisturizers can be added in. And the last point, allergen avoidance measures. House dust mites are the most important source of allergens for canine atopic dermatitis worldwide. There is still not much evidence, only one uncontrolled study, but control measures should be relevant and might be effective in dogs hypersensitive to such allergens. A benefit is likely to take some months to occur due to the long persistence of mite allergens environment. And there are various measures for dust mite control, and I would like to refer you to the VACTA website if you would like more information on the various measures available. And regard, uh, regarding allergen avoidance measures, of course, effective flea control and a reduction of contact with offending food, environmental, or microbial allergens would be ideal wherever and whenever possible. And just to quickly summarize, the treatment should always be tailor-made for each patient. It should also depend on whether we're treating acute flares or chronic lesions, or whether the lesions are localized or generalized. And the topic dogs are best approached with a combination therapy. And I now hand over to, or back to Professor. Thank you, Kirsten, for that very nice overview of the, what we've got in our pharmacy to take care with these problems. <clears throat> so here is the first case, Holly. Holly is a three-year-old spayed female beagle cross who showed gradual development of non-seasonal pruritus over one year. And in this case, we actually did both intradermal skin tests and serology. So we can see some generalized erythema. We can see excuse me, here we've got actually some quite nice little pustular lesions with some crust suggestive of a pyoderma. 
here we've got a superficial otitis externa, and here we've got interdigital erythema. So our laboratory findings, ear cytology was unremarkable. The interdigital smears were unremarkable. Uh, cytology from crusting lesions reveals neutrophils, some with intracytoplasmic cocci, and we have positive IgE serology for environmentals. Now, every atopic dog that you see should have a hypoallergenic diet trial. It would be very unfortunate to put an animal on a lifetime of antipyritic therapy when all we needed was to change the diet. So every animal of this series of 10 will have had a hypoallergenic diet trial. So what are Holly's treatment options? Well, we don't just take one drug off the shelf and give it for six months and say, come back again, again and let's see what's happening. We sit back and we add up all the information we've got and we define a short-term and a long-term treatment program. So our basic approach here would be allergen-specific immunotherapy or asset for environmentals. We could get some initial help here by using Lokivetmab, which will give us immediate relief of the pruritus. And I would prefer to use that rather than oxacitinib or rather than systemic corticosteroids in this case to get some initial control because of the secondary bacterial infection we have. There's some suggestions that oxacitinib ox may predispose to bacterial infection. No indication that Lokivetmab will. And of course, corticosteroids certainly will predispose to infection. So let's, in this case, go with Lokivetmab. Every animal in this series of 10 is going to have the same approach to barrier function. This is not magic. It's just support that's going to make this animal do better in the long term. Not overnight, not next week, not next month, but in the long term. So as Kirsten has emphasized, if we're taking care of the barrier function, we can either use these dermatology support diets that many pet food manufacturers have developed, or essential fatty acid supplements, or we can use application of topical lipid formulations, which are really a sort of artificial barrier, and general coat hygiene. So every animal we're going to deal with is going to get that. I won't go over that anymore. Every animal we deal with is going to have flea and tick control, so I won't go over that anymore. What else are we going to do for Holly? Well, there's a little bit of pyoderma, but probably not enough to warrant systemic antibiotics. Probably we're going to get away with antibacterial shampoos. And yes, we can. Uh, we'll need to clean the ears out. Remember, cytology was normal in the ears. No need to use antibacterials or antifungal agents. Just a simple steroid preparation in the ear is going to be fine. And Holly, in fact, did very well on this approach. So Genevieve, Genevieve is a two-year-old female Newfoundland with an 18-month history of chronic diarrhea with concomitant pruritus for the last six months. You can see that for a Newfoundland, she's fairly stunted. You can see a very woolly, poor hair coat, lackluster hair coat. You can see through the hair coat, you can see some evidence of underlying erythema. When we clip some of the hair, we've got some little papular pustular crusts. And when we look under um, <clears throat> high par, we can see that this is a very nice little papular crustus folliculitis that she's developed as well. 
So what about Genevieve's lab findings first off? Well, we first started off working up for uh, the GI problem because remember she'd had chronic diarrhea since a young age. Fecal examination was normal. Serum folate and B12 were normal. Cytology under the crust revealed neutrophils with cocci confirming we've got a bacterial infection. And intradermal testing was positive to D. farinae and D. terranissimus and to the storage mic Acrocero. So Genevieve went on to a hypoallergenic dart trial, uh, in this case fish and rice, and there was a 50% response uh, on the fish and rice dart with relapse upon challenge. So we've got a combination here of an adverse food reaction and atopic dermatitis. So what do we do for Genevieve? Well, we've got to go on to some immunotherapy. In this case, we chose acid for D. farinae and Teranissimus. You'll notice that I've left out a zero, acrocero, because in dogs, acrocero cross-reacts with D. farinae. So the reactivity to acrocero probably was because of D. farinae. It's not the same in cats. In cats, they don't cross-react, but in dogs, they do. So all we need is to put D. farinae and Teranissimus in the allergen immunotherapy vaccine. Same support for the barrier function, which we're going to do in every case. And on the right-hand side for the secondary complications, she's certainly going to need some systemic antibiotics for a period of 21 days. Hopefully after that, we can get by with antibacterial shampoos. Flea and tick control, of course, and here's an instance, as dust mites are so important, where we can try dust mite control, recognizing that if we do, it's going to take some three to four months before we can get rid of the majority of the dust mite antigens, which are secreted in the dust mite feces. So Genevieve also did very well. Third case is George. George is a three-year-old neutered male standard poodle who'd had three episodes of otitis and recently started rubbing his face and chewing at his feet. And again, with this case, we did both intradermal testing and serology. Not suggesting that you need to do that, but she was part of a study when he was part of a study when we were comparing the results of serology and intradermal skin tests. So George has an otitis, superficial otitis. When you look deep down in the horizontal canal, there was no exudate at all and interdigital erythema. And if we look at the lab findings, ear cytology was unremarkable. Impression smears from the feet were unremarkable. Positive IgE serology. Hypoallergenic diet trial, no appreciable reduction in foot chewing and otitis still recurred. So these are all things every animal we have in the workup for atopic dermatitis is going to do, uh, go through this tranche of tests before we decide on the therapeutic options. So what are we going to do for George? Well, I think again, uh, Allergen-specific immunotherapy for environmentals would be our preferred approach. There's no reason why, because this takes some time to act. In this case, we couldn't use a little systemic corticosteroids. There's no pyoderma we need to be aware of. Or we could use topical corticosteroids to help it on its way. The barrier function, the same. And then the secondary complications, we've got nothing except a little ear cleansing to do, and we can use just steroids for the ear. There's no nasty pathogens found in our cytology and flea and trick dick control. So George is really a pretty straightforward case that should do well uh, on long-term allergen-specific immunotherapy. 
Here's Lucy. Lucy is obviously a much more severe case. Lucy is a five-year-old boxer, female neutered, with a three-year history of gradually worsening perennial pruritus. And you can see when you look at Lucy, you can see there is obvious uh, erythema, irritation, lichenification around the neck, in the axilla, in the ventral abdomen with hyperpigmentation. Here, I think we'd probably done an intradermal skin test. So this is a fairly severe case rather than the last one, which was really fairly simple and straightforward. So Lucy has a nasty proliferative otitis externa as well. Hard to get an otoscope down there with a lot of waxy exudate, suggestive of malassezia. Lichenification of the interdigital spaces, again suggestive of malassezia. What about our lab findings then? Well, ear swabs showed lots and lots and lots of malassezia. Tape strips from the axilla, the ventral abdomen, and the volar aspect of the feet all showed lots and lots of malassezia. Uh, positive intradermal skin tests in this case, uh, intradermal testing was done. And we did serology for um, malassezia and for staph, and there was a strongly positive serology, IgE serology, for malassezia. No reduction in the level of pruritus with the hypoallergenic diet trial. So lots of malassezia and IgE antibodies to malassezia and um, IgE antibodies to environmental antigens. So lots of things to do for Lucy. <clears throat> Firstly, our basic approach would include acid for environmentals. Acid, of course, is relatively inexpensive long term, and it's one of the only two therapies, therapies that has the potential to produce a cure uh, in atopic dermatitis, the other being cyclosporin. So we'd give acid for environmentals, and in this case, we've got lots of IgE antibody, which is obviously contributing to the pruritic load. If you've got a lot of antigen on the skin to which you're allergic, then that's likely to increase your pruritus. Now, we want some help here because we've got pretty severe acute inflammation, and we could use either oclocitinib or locivetmab to get things under control before the acid starts to work. And the same barrier function support. And up here for the secondary complications, where you've got this thickened lichenified skin with malassezia, you absolutely need to have systemic antifungals. You're not going to get a very good response with topical antifungals. So we'll give systemic antifungals and we'll give antibacterial antifungal shampoos. Ear cleansing and treatment. Now, what did we find down the ears? We just found malassezia. So we can actually get away with just using steroid. Interestingly, one of our residents when I was at Florida did a study on uh, Panalog, which at that uh, time contained um, triamcinolone, nystatin, neomycin, thiastreptone, and the base. Which of these, of, of these uh, uh, elements was the most effective in reducing the level of malassezia? It was the triamcinolone. Remember that malassezia just proliferates in abnormal skin and abnormal ears. So we wouldn't have to use a whole lot of antibiotics down here or indeed a whole lot of antifungals because we remember we're getting systemic antifungals anyway. Steroids are all that we need. So a severe case needing very comprehensive therapy. Acid for environmentals, acid for malassezia, oclocitinib and locivetmab and or, and then antifungals. Hamish is an interesting case. Well, all these cases are interesting actually, but Hamish was a particularly interesting case.
Hamish is a five-year-old uh, neutered male lurcher cross, generalized non-seasonal paritis treated with steroids. And you can see with Hamish that it looks as if he's got flea bite allergy. Does he or doesn't he? He's also got periorbital um, uh, er, um, er, hair loss and hyperkeratosis and some lichenification. He's got, uh, he's been chewing at his feet where he's got lichenification, hyperkeratosis, and some generalized erythema, and a few sort of papular lesions, maybe a little tiny bit of pyoderma here, but not very severe pyoderma. And then if we look in the ear, we've got obvious rather chronic otitis externa. And here we've got the lesions on the back that are very, very suggestive of flea allergy dermatitis. Well, Hamish was an interesting dog because Hamish slept on his back and frequently rubs the lumbar region where he would rub on the carpeting. There was no response to, flea, to the flea control program, and we were left with the belief that because he was lying on his back, the dust mites to which he's allergic gained access in that region and rendered him looking like as if he had flea allergy dermatitis, which he didn't. Otic cytology, non-remarkable, skin scrapings negative, coat brushings negative for evidence of fleas. And in addition to that, we had intensive flea control program to which there's no response. And the hypoallergenic dart trial, there was no response. So what do we do with Hamish? Well, Hamish, again, I think would want to start with acid for environmentals. And he'd want to have some help initially, probably in this case from oxacitinib. Not enough to warrant systemic antibiotics, just some antibacterial shampoos. <clears throat> and ear cleansing and treatment, again, just with steroids, because there's no evidence of significant bacterial infection in the ears, and flea and tick control. So Hamish eventually did well, having confused this by presenting looking like flea allergy dermatitis. Well, Jerry, Jerry is a male castrated four-year-old Labrador with non-seasonal paritis for the past 1.5 years. You can see that around the anal area here, there's some hyperpigmentation, some lichenification, some scale, some erythema extending down the legs. You can see there's a nasty otitis externa here, chronic. You can see there's crusting and erythema here, suggestive of a bacterial skin infection. And going down the limbs, there is focal areas of hair loss with, again, some obvious areas of pyoderma extending down the legs. So what about Jerry? Well, ear cytology showed, in this case, overgrowth of malassezia and cocci. So we're going to treat this aggressively. And the cocci were noted under the crusts uh, on the flank. IgE serology results were positive to about 30 allergens, mostly weak to moderate reactions. Hypoallergenic DART trial showed no improvement. Well, we've got some different options here. If we were to go with immunotherapy, and we've got 30 allergens to which uh, the dog was positive, we're going to have to go through the hassle of making up two vaccines, which you can certainly do. Um, but an alternative, if you've got animals as with as many positives as that, was to use cyclosporin. And cyclosporin actually 
is quite good with pyodermas, much better with pyodermas in one of the early studies than was methylprednisolone. So we could use cyclosporin, the same barrier support. We're going to certainly need 20 days of systemic antibiotics to start with, antibacterial shampoos. We might need to have systemic and excuse me, systemic antibiotics. We will use systemic antibiotics and antibacterial shampoos to follow up with. We'll certainly uh, need to clean the ears, and here we will need to have a combination of uh, antifungals, uh, antibacterials, and steroids, and our usual flea and tick control. So a rather comprehensive therapy, spearheaded by cyclosporin, systemic antibiotics, followed with antibacterial shampoos, and aggressive ear treatment. Helen was a six-year-old spade female beagle who lived on the beach in North Carolina, a four-year history of generalized pruritus. Fleas were seen and treated, but the sort of life she led made it very difficult to get a pure, a completely effective flea control. So we've got Severe lesions of lichenification, erythema in the axillary region here, in the ventral abdomen, the umbilical region, and around the vulva. We've got dorsal lesions suggestive of flea allergy dermatitis, very typical for flea allergy dermatitis, and fleas have been seen. So what are the lab findings for Helen? Well, tape strips and impression smears from the axilla and groin showed, surprise, surprise, lots of malassezia. Coat brushing showed flea dirt, positive intradermal skin test, positive IgE serology for malassezia. Rigorous flea control relieved the dorsal pruritus and there was some hair regrowth, but the foot chewing and licking and rubbing of the ventrum persisted. Hypoallergenic dart trial showed no improvement. So, Helen, remember, had positive malassezia IgE, so we're going to again do immunotherapy for malassezia as well as immunotherapy for environmentals. We are going to use systemic antifungals wherever you've got um, uh, lichenification associated with malassezia. You'll need to get in there with systemic anti antifungals and follow up with antifungal shampoos. Flea and tick control, of course. We can probably use some topical corticosteroids on these lesions. As we are controlling the malassezia with antifungals, we can, on the skin, use a little bit of topical steroids to aid resolution. And Helen, in fact, ended up, again, doing very nicely. Toby is a two-year-old West Highland with paritis and foot chewing, which started at six months of age. We've got generalized erythema. Again, we've got an otitis, particularly affecting the inner ear flap. We've got pustular lesions and self-excoriation lesions on the flank. We've got interdigital erythema and volar aspect of the feet. We've got quite severe erythema. So tape strips in the feet showed lots of cocci. Ear cytology showed lots of cocci. Cytology from the crust on the flank showed neutrophils with uh, ingested cocci. And here we've got a positive IgE serology for environmentals. And we've also got positive, high positive IgE against staphylococcus antigen. So again, if you think of all this stuff on the skin, if you've got a lot of IgE antibodies to it, this is likely exacerbating significantly the pruritic um, load on this animal. No response to a hypoallergenic diet trial. So Toby 
we are going to use acid for environmentals. We're going to also use acid with staphylococcal phage lysate. This is a product made in the United States, which um, has shown to be effective in recurrent pyoderma, idiopathic recurrent pyoderma. And also, it's indicated to use in uh, where you've got a lot of IgE antibody to staph. So two major indications, recurrent idiopathic pyoderma, and also where you've got IgE antibodies to staphylococci. And this can be obtained through evac to animal health. Also, acid for environmentals. Here we've got an acutely affected animal, and we could get things very much better very quickly using Lokivetmab. We're going to need some systemic antibiotics, 20 days followed by antibacterial shampoos. And ear cleansing, we've got lots of cocci there, so we're going to need combination ear treatment and aggressive ear treatment. And of course, flea and tick shampoos. So really combination therapy uh, of quite aggressive in this very acute, severely affected Westy. Frankie. Frankie is a two-year-old male castrated cocker, licks feet, rubs face since one year of age, two episodes of otitis externa, and recently developed an eruption on the ventral abdomen. So you can see the perioral erythema here, and lovely little staph infection on the ventral abdomen. Lots of lovely little pustules. So the laboratory findings for Frankie, scrapings and impression smears from the perioral region, no abnormality. Samples from the pustules of the ventral abdomen reveal neutrophils with cocci, some intracellularly, positive IgE serology for environmentals. No response to a hypoallergenic diet trial. So again, a fairly straightforward case. And this, I think, would benefit long term from acid to environmentals. We're going to have to use some systemic antibiotics, some antibacterial shampoos to follow up with, and the rest of the barrier function and flea and tick control, as with the others. And our last case for this afternoon is Susie. Susie is a four-year-old spayed female cocker with pruritus from 18 months of age, initially seasonal and now perennial. She'd had two episodes of otitis externa, and the pruritus was 50% better when uh, controlled with antibiotics. You can see some um, skin scaling here, some dandruff. You you can see the dandruff here. You can see the nice crusted lesions here, um, suggestive of a bacterial pyoderma. When we shave the skin, you can see very nice evidence of pyoderma. And we take some cytology from under here and lots of cocci and neutrophils. And we look at the uh, interdigital area of the feet, and that is a bit suggestive of malassezia, isn't it? So our lab findings with Susie, samples from pustules and under the crust showed neutrophils and cocci. So we've got uh, confirmed our bacterial pyoderma. But the interdigital impression smears showed lots of malassezia, positive intradermal tests. The IgG serology was positive for malassezia, but there was no IgE antibodies against malassezia. So what do we do about that? Uh, probably nothing as regards immunotherapy. We would only use immunotherapy against malassezia if we've got IgG. This tells you that, if, if, if we've got IgE, excuse me, this just tells you that you've got lots of malassezia there. So our treatment options, acid for environmentals, and let's get some 
pruritic control by starting off with Lokivetmab, systemic antibiotics, antibacterial shampoos, antifungal shampoos, flea and tick control, and so forth. So what do we do if we've got treatment failures? We reassess the diagnosis. Is it incorrect or incomplete? Are the secondary factors we've not identified? Are we dealing with a topic like dermatitis, IgE negative? Should we use combination therapy? Well, cyclosporin and steroids is fine for the first four to five weeks, then discontinue the corticosteroids. Cyclosporin and acid, again, that's fine. Oxacitinib and acid, lots of US veterinarians like this as one of their preferred approaches. Uh, Octocypinib and corticosteroids, okay only for a short course of corticosteroids. Octocytinib and Lokivetmab should provide no added benefit. One is just mopping up the IL-31, the other stopping it getting access to the receptor, so no benefit. Don't use octocytinib and cyclosporin. Uh, uh, it's not a good idea because both are immunosuppressive. Lokivetmab and acid is okay. Reduce lokivetmab in time. Lokivetmab and corticosteroids, again, should be okay. So this is our 10th case complete and a run over of the, the newer treatments for the development uh, that have uh, that have been developed in the treatment of atopic dermatitis. And now uh, Kirsten and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that our participants may have. If I can just get this thing in the middle which I can't. I knew this would happen. I'm having difficulty reading it. James, does controlling IL-31 uh, have benefits affecting the skin barrier? Good question. I suspect only secondarily in that if you uh, are controlling, controlling the pruritus and the animal is scratching less, it's going to have less effect on the skin barrier, it's going to less disturb the skin barrier. So probably an indirect effect, but not, I don't think, a direct effect. What is the oral antifungal scheme you prefer? Uh, Kirsten, would you want to discuss that? Oh, what what is the oral antifungal uh, regime that you prefer for okay. malassezia? I think my micro is back on. Can can you hear me? Yes, exactly yes. now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, the oral antifungal I prefer. Um, the fungiconazole, which contains ketoconazole, that is licensed in the UK for dogs for the treatment of. Uh, dermatophytosis and uh, I find that quite handy um, for, for treatment of dogs and, and obviously very beneficial for treating malassezia dermatitis. Um, and itraconazole um, can also be used as quite um, beneficial for malassezia dermatitis and the study has shown that even um, treating with itraconazole on two consecutive days per week uh, is also effective, although the pruritus resolves faster with daily treatment. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, what is a good choice of topical steroids? Um, well, I think the hydrocortisone acepinate, which um, Kirsten mentioned, I think is a uh, good choice, but for the ear when you don't want combination? Well, you can certainly use the uh, human preparations, uh, 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 prednisolone forte, and I see no reason why you shouldn't use some, um, some uh, hydrocortisone acepinate in the ear. Um, certainly people are talking about that now, and it should be effective. Or, as I say, you can use the uh, human steroid uh, air preparations.
how long does it take for adverse food reactions to develop? Can it be a delayed reaction? Well, now I'm not quite sure what you mean about that. Um, adverse food reactions will typically develop in animals at a younger age with a peak age of onset before one year of age. Um, so I think that's as far as I can go with that. Um, which hypoallergenic diet do you usually choose? Well, I think that it, it is helpful to do serology for IgE, food, food specific IgE, not because that necessarily is going to make a diagnosis, because that's going to point you in the right suggestion, in the right direction. So far, none of the um, hydrolyzed darts have been proven to be 100% uh, effective as um, you know the gold standard for diagnosing atopic dermatitis. But Kirsten, do you have any comments on that? On hydrolyzed diets, oh. um, I quite like to use the unallergenic from Royal uh, Canine um, or the Purina HA or Famina Vet Life Ultra Hypo because they're the second generation hydrolyzed diets. Um, and yeah, not 100% hydrolyzed, but extensively hydrolyzed. I've got quite good results with those diets. And uh, alternatively, it's still the home home prepared diet. Um, if you want to be 100% sure, you, you're going for a novel and single protein diet. Uh, how long do you use Lokivetmab for? Well, that's a Good question. Um, I mean, you could le use it for life, but I don't think, I think that'd be rather expensive. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think that Lokivetmab was developed for lifetime control well, it, 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 of atopic dermatitis, because I think there are other approaches. Remember, Lokivetmab is not going to, as far as we know, cure atopic dermatitis. It's very, very effective control. And if you want a cure, you're better going with acid uh, or with cyclosporin. And I suspect that a lot of people now are going to go to use acid supplemented by Lokivetmab. So until the acid gets control, then you'll keep going with Lokivetmab uh, for uh, four to six months or however long it takes. Um, what antibiotics do you favor, Kirsten? Do you have a thought on that? I favor cephalexin. <laughs> Short answer, cephalexin. Um, have autogenous bacterial vaccines been shown to be effective? Well, that's a good question. Um, Certainly, they have been used in, in the past, and I think people will still use them. I, I don't think there's any suggestion that they are more or less effective than would be the staphylococcal phage lysate, which is readily available. And that, I think, is, is, is quite a useful product. Again, it's not going to cure every animal, but it is going to be, I think, quite useful in a number of cases. Do you use combined barrier control and antimicrobial shampoos. Uh, well, you could do, if your, your barrier control could be oral, the suggestion is that essential fatty acids orally or the use of some of these uh, dermatology support darts are just as effective in restoring the barrier as our application of topical lipids. So I think that you can certainly use your, uh, your oral barrier repair mechanisms, and then you can use your shampoo mechanisms, your shampoo applications, antibacterial shampoos. Now, you may say that that's going to wash away your lipids, and it is, so you're really a bit between a rock and a hard place. Uh, but if you keep supplementing the animal orally, I think you'll get by with a good antimicrobial shampoo. Is 
if a dog has been on a particular dart for the duration of of its life, uh, later in life, is a possibility of an adverse food reaction. Um, yes, I think, uh, you know, dogs can develop adverse food reactions if they've been on the same diet for months or even years. I mean, if you're seeking uh, a, a culprit, you will normally tend to go for something that's been introduced recently, but there's no reason why an animal can't develop an adverse food reaction if it's been on the diet for four or five years. Do you have an upper age limit for acid, Kirsten? Do you have an upper age limit for acid? Good question. No, recently restarted an older dog, can't remember, seven or eight years old, and again he responded really well to it. So, no. Do you? No, no. <laughs> I don't think there's an upper age limit. Now, the only thing is, if you're starting with an animal of sort of 10 or 12 or 13, um, A, why wasn't it diagnosed earlier? Because bear in mind that atopic dermatitis doesn't commence over seven years of age. Uh, is the diagnosis correct? Um, but you can certainly start with acid, but I'd want to give it some help and relief with locivetmab or something like that. Um, I can't possibly answer the question which laboratories do you prefer for acid testing as this um, seminar is sponsored by um, Avatra Animal Health. You draw your own conclusion. Um, can you use Apoquel for moist dermatitis? Kirsten, what do you think? If the lesion is sterile and it's really just an itch, yeah, why not? But Apoqual is more antipyritic, not so good for anti-inflammatory. So it de depends on what's going on. I would definitely rule out um, a secondary infection. And if it's localized, I would probably prefer topical therapy rather than systemic and unless the moist dermatitis is completely generalized and, and the last question was any suggestions for medications to use for cats with allergic dermatitis I think that's going to be I'm sure the topic of a next webinar but we don't have time to get into cats now well, thank you very, very much for your attention, and I hope this has been useful for you both. And Kirsten, thank you very much for joining me in this. On behalf of Webinar Club, I'd like to thank Professor Halliwell and Kirsten Pattenberg for an excellent webinar today. The recording and the certificate of attendance for this webinar will be available in the next few days, and we will email you as soon as they are ready. Thank you all for attending. That's the end of the webinar.